Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our event this afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, both in person and virtually. For those of you who I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Abby Sachs. I serve as the program manager for the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy, a program of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies here at Grand Valley State University. Um, and today's keynote is a part of our Wheelhouse Talk series which is an opportunity for leaders who have shaped our communities to share their stories. And I have to say, I am especially excited for today's guest. Uh, many of you may be carrying various weights into this room and in a world that can sometimes feel too big to make a difference in, Mary Kay Hoodhood's story is a breath of fresh air as the title of her new memoir in this presentation, What I Can Do Will Reveal. And I'm also excited to be sharing the stage with the student who will be introducing Mary today. Emma Loveland is a senior at Grand Valley studying statistics with minors in Spanish and criminal justice. As a first year CLA fellow candidate, she has, in her own words, made tons of new friends in the CLA and has come to find how she exemplifies leadership in her own life. Emma was a member of the GVSU varsity softball team for her first three years at Grand Valley and is now a member of the GVSU club softball team. Emma also has a passion for singing and has joined GV Groove Acapella this year. You can see them perform in the upcoming International Co Championship of Collegiate Acapella on February 25th in Grand Ledge. Outside of school, she enjoys spending time outdoors, reading animals, and spending time with friends and family. After graduation, Emma will be attending the University of Michigan, where she plans to get her master's degree in data science and analytics. And on top of all of this, Mary and Emma have had the opportunity to work together for over two years. So please help me in welcoming Emma to the stage. Thank you, Abby, for that warm welcome. Um, I'm so excited to be here today with all of you, and I'm so grateful that I get to introduce you to my friend, Mary. Um, like Abby said, my name is Emma, I'm a senior, and I'm a statistics major with minors in Spanish and criminal justice. I'm here to introduce the wonderful Mary Kay Hoodhood to all of you, but I thought I would give a little bit of back background on her to start. Mary was in a car accident when she was just 27 years old, leaving her paralyzed. Since then, she has been in a wheelchair, so Mary relies on others for help. I am honored to be one of many people who get to assist Mary in doing those things that we take for granted. Mary founded Kids Food Basket after hearing a story about an elementary school student digging through the trash at school for food. At the beginning of Kids Food Basket, they gave a sack supper to about 125 children at three Grand Rapids public schools. Today, Kids Food Basket currently gives out 1.6 million meals a year. If starting Kids Food Basket wasn't enough, she also is an advocate for those with disabilities. Despite having those daily limitations, Mary has always been able to accomplish what she puts her mind to. Prior to Kids Food Basket, she volunteered and worked for God's Kitchen, coordinating three programs and working for disability advocates. Her ability to inspire those around her has made Mary Kay a leader who prioritizes the needs who are often the needs of those who are often marginalized in society. For her work, Mary Kay has been honored with many, many awards, among them L'Oreal Woman of Worth, M. Lives 10 Women Who Shaped the State, the George Romney Lifetime Achievement Award from the State of Michigan, and the Presidential Citizens Medal from Barack Obama. She also just finished writing her first book, a memoir, which will be available outside after the presentation. I highly recommend it. This memoir is called What I Can Do, and it encompasses all of the hardships faced by Mary in her lifetime and how she has overcome them. Truly an inspirational story, demonstrating that many things in our life are out of our reach, but focusing on what you are capable of can get you a long way. I have had the privilege of working with Mary for in her home as an attendant over the past two years, just helping Mary out in any way I can. I get to do all sorts of things, such as make meals, clean the house, just chit chat with Mary, or hang out with her adorable grandson, JJ. Over this time, I've begun to know Mary very well. I can describe her as humble, compassionate, empathetic, and inspiring. Mary is a role model to so many people, including myself. I admire her courage to get up every day and strive to be the best that she can be. Mary has touched so many lives, and I hope I'm able to help even the even half of the amount of people she has helped in her life. I'm able to connect with Mary in a way that I can't with a lot of people. And I think this is because she makes people feel safe and secure. So yes, technically she's my boss, 
but also I'd like to call Mary a friend. Please join me in welcoming Mary Kay Hood Hood. So thank you very, very much for this great opportunity to come and talk about my least favorite subject myself. I'd rather talk about anything else than my health, the lack of my health, and my life. But I'm gonna do it just for you guys. I really, really do love to go out in the community, talk about Kids Food Basket, which we'll talk about in a while, and talk about Grand Rapids. I grew up here, lived on the North End most of my life. I'm the youngest of six children. My dad was a lawyer in town. My mother, the sweetest person in the world, was a housemaker. And we spent just the days, just like, let's say, not the Brady Bunch, but we'll go back a little bit further. It's more like uh, the I, Harriet, Ozzie and Harriet was my life. You know, those of you that were there know. So just lived a great, great childhood in the North End, grew up there, went to Catholic schools. My parents were the type of people that were very involved in the community. You know, doing everything from church stuff with, the, with all the, um, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and Catholic Daughters and all of the, the church picnics and all that. One thing that I remember for sure is every year that my dad and my uncle and I would go and get um, sleds. And this is such an odd thing, I don't know what we were doing at Christmas time and took them to the west side of Grand Rapids where there was Villa Maria, which was a home for wayward girls. That was one of the things that we did every year was take sleds. And so I always remember my dad always going and working with the Elks and all kinds of groups. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about my family was that my dad, even though all of his children went to Catholic schools, he was the first Catholic member of the Grand Rapids Public School Board. And because he knew how important uh, public education is. And it's so important for our kids. When I started feeding kids, it was only Grand Rapids Public Schools. Then we expanded. But you know, it's so important that we keep these kids because they're our future and we all know that. So, yes, I used to be cute and sweet. <laughs> I have four older brothers. Do you know what that'll do to you? Yeah. I was tough. We went out to a cottage in Silver Lake out by Rockford every year. And those are my best memories and my best times that I can remember just being carefree and fun and my brother's trying to drown me. Yeah, it was, it was just great. It was just living, you know, living the life. It's a, it was wonderful. My mother was just the sweetest person. And you know how when you get older and people say, oh, you're turning into your mother? I go, yeah, I hope so. I hope I'm half the woman that she was. Just a sweetheart, one of those people that just, you just could feel the calm. It's wonderful. Big at the holidays, my brother Terry, that was just four years older than me, just goofier than the day is long there. The little one, there he is again over on the left. He'd kill me if he knew I was showing these pictures up here today. Yep, high school, I went to a Catholic girls academy right up the hill over here. It's now low income housing. But it was a great, great experience. Still hanging around with those women, just solid, solid people, and made me what I am today. Just really, you know, you are who you hang around with. And that's one of the key things that I've found in life. I had a, early on a, a, a therapist. 
she was a physical therapist, and she said, in life, whether we like it or not, we're all dependent on the people around us. And the key is to surround yourself with people that you know you can depend on. That, and another thing that I was told early on in my, it, it, after I was injured, was about peace comes from within. And if you really can grasp that and internalize that and live by that, it really is very powerful if you can grasp that and understand it. All right, I'm out of high school now. There I graduated. I was in went college years. I went to Grand Rapids Community College because I, when I graduated, I said to my mom, so what am I gonna do now? And she said, well, you need to be with young people. And so the most important thing to do is to go to college. So that's what I did. I have an associate's degree in early childhood development. And then I had an opportunity to go to Michigan State. You can go to the next one. And I graduated from Michigan State in 1973 with an, a degree in education. I went and did my student teaching at Riverside Elementary, which is a really nice school out in the North End. And I thought, boy, would I be a bad teacher. And I thought, you know, there's enough crappy teachers around. I guess I won't do that. I'll do everybody a favor. So I was working at my dad's office, um, keeping time cards. And one of the other lawyers said to me, well, what are you going to do now? You're graduating from college. You better figure it out. And I said, well, I guess I'd like to stay in Lansing. So he said, well, you know, there's organizations down there called lobbyists or public information organizations. And the lawyers, the doctors, the insurance people, they all have representatives. And so he introduced me to some people down there. And I got a job with the uh, Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Michigan. That was a great job, wonderful. Learned so much. Learned about the legislative process. Learned that it's, you know, a mess. And just, just really, though I, I was there for like five years, and that was a very, very important part in, in my life and my development. And also the other thing, when I'm looking back at my life from my 70-year-old vantage, I, I think that when I was a kid, I got to be a kid. When I was a young adult and a teenager, I got to live my life and doing the things that should, you should be doing then. Didn't they have a lot of responsibility? When I went to school, when I was single before I got married and I had a, a job, I think all of that fell into place. And so when I was injured, when I was 27, that's young. So when I was injured and I started, and they had a lot of time to think about, well, now my life's gonna change. I, I wasn't looking back and saying, oh, but if I could have done this or I could have done that, because I felt up to that point in my life that I'd lived my life in the right order. And true to my mom, I was, I'm blessed with, from God, with a very even temperament. And that served me well in my life. But I got it, you know, just because I got to do the things that, in the right order. So when I was 27, went to San Francisco in 1977, and then I met my husband. My then boyfriend, now husband, who was driving the car, we were together a year and a half. We were already engaged. He's a year younger than I am. I thought if I married somebody younger that he would be so multi, boy, did I get fooled. And we were in an automobile accident. It was Memorial Day weekend. It was, there were no drugs or anything involved. We were going up to Silver Lake, the one up by Hart Camping, up north of Muskegon up there. 
we were on a very flat, not a killy or anything road. I was in the front seat wearing a Volkswagen Beetle. Jeff's five-year-old daughter was on my lap. And I, we were sort of falling asleep. And Jeff was driving and sadly a seven-year-old boy ran out into the traffic and he ran right into the front of the car. So Jeff swerved to miss him and a Bronco hit us and the car went rolling and rolling and rolling. Well, God does a very wonderful thing for, did a very wonderful thing for me and I blacked out. But I've heard reports and seen the reports that the car was crushed around me. And it took them a while to figure out that I was even in the car, it was that bad. It took like two hours with the jaws of life to get me out of there. And of course, I don't remember any of this, but I was told. They took me to Ackley Hospital and said, no, she's too serious, get her out of here took me to Blodgett Hospital, and I was there, and many, I had, in fact, a friend who later on was one of my attendants. She was there that evening. She said, for sure, we didn't think you were going to make it. But I'm tough, remember? So I was there for a three and a half months, and I went to a hospital in Denver, because one of my, there I am in the hospital with my friend Candy, my mom. Um, I went there because my cousin's wife is a nurse and she told me that's a good place for you to go. You need to go there, you need to go there. And it's all spinal cord injuries, injured people like me. So I thought that that would be a good thing. Well, it's grueling, you know, that rehab is not fun. And I was there three and a half months. We were, went there and just tried to do the best you can. And I just spent my days praying and hoping I'd get as strong as I could. And also thanking God every day that my head wasn't hit. I'm sure I was two inches from a head injury. So I went to rehab was there for, like I said, three and a half months. Got out of the hospital and thought, okay, well, I'm gonna have to come up with a new dream. I'm gonna have to come up with a new expectation out of life. Because now I need help with everything that I do. So, trying to swallow that pill was not easy. But with the support of people around you. And I did a really, really smart thing. I married Jeff. So we got married about six, eight months later. He had fun planning the wedding. My wedding day was pretty sad because there were two things missing. My dad was already passed away and the fact that I couldn't walk down the aisle. That was a tough one for me. So I thought, well, what am I gonna do here? Got married at St. Alphonse Church, big old church. And I didn't wanna go down the aisle. I did not want to roll down the aisle. At that point, I wasn't even using an electric wheelchair because when I was injured, I, they had electric wheelchairs, but I had, a, I had a manual wheelchair. I only wanted to use that because I thought it was less conspicuous. And the other thing that went out the door when I was injured was my self-esteem. I had no self-esteem. If you would have asked me to go up and speak on this stage, there's no way that I would have done it. In fact, when I went back to school, because I did go back to get my master's, I swear that the only thing that I said during the whole thing was, 
Hi, my name is Mary Kay Hooded. I didn't even talk or participate because I didn't have the self-esteem that I used to have. It was very interesting and was not an easy task to be able to regain that self-esteem that I needed. And when Abby asked me to come and speak today, I said, you know, I'll come and talk to our future leaders because I know that's who you guys are. I said, but I don't really even frame myself as a leader. I don't look at myself as a leader. I know I am because I know I've done some stuff, but I don't really look at myself. But I do understand that I lead by example. I do understand that in my mind that I know what to do and that I do it and then I explain to other people how they can help do it. And if that's what being a leader is, I guess I'm one. But anyway, back to Jeff. So we got married, and we bought a house. I, after about a week after we got married, Jeff said, okay, now it's a good time to go find a house. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. He said, all I care about is the garage. That's good. Well, he installed car stereos. He needed a garage, and that was it. So I, we did find a nice house, and I thought, now I'm a housewife. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> right? I can just go in the garden, make a few, make a little food. You know, we're all set. And the one thing that I did that was really smart, though, I because of the Michigan catastrophic fund. I knew that I would have personal care attendants. And I could have used a nursing service, but I didn't. I was very, very smart in that I hired all my own people because I knew that I wanted people that cared about me to be my hands and my feet. And that was really smart that I did that and it not changed it over all these 43 years that I've been injured. So anyway, back to this. Our wedding, what I did was I sat in that chair and my back was to the audience. And then when everybody was in the church, then my four brothers came and picked me up and turned me around. And I couldn't believe how many people was there, how many people. That's so we invited 400 people. I have a lot of cousins. And Jeff was belly aching about paying to have it, have, having to uh, pay the bar bill there. You know, he didn't like that he had to pay for all the booze that they were drinking. But I said, he's got a bunch of weightlifter friends. I said, I want to pay for the food that those guys are eating. <laughs> yeah, but it was really a beautiful event. And yeah, 42 years we'll be married this year. This is where I'm talking about my attendant. Patty was my very first attendant. It was a girl that I knew that worked at a nursing home. So she worked at a nursing home, so I figured she knew what to do. But she came to Craig, and so did Jeff, and my mother, and they were all uh, trained in my care. These are some of my attendants now. And there's Julian, my grandson. He's a freeloader. He spends a lot of his time riding on my feet here. <laughs> yeah, I really don't know what I'd do without all, all these people. You know what it's really taught me besides having to ask for everybody for every drink and every itch and every wipe my nose and every all of that? It's made me understand how important it is to be succinct, to be eloquent when you're talking. And that served me well because when I um, started volunteering after I was injured, it was a huge, huge um, boost to my rehab. And it was volunteer management. So, you know, I spent a lot of time talking, a lot of time explaining to people what you need to do to be successful. What do you got to do? Where do you have to go? This, all that. And so, you know, I, I really learned to develop my language arts. So uh, I was at God's Kitchen only for 22 years. 
and started out as a volunteer, uh, coordinating the route for Meals on Wheels. Five drivers. I had five drivers when I started. Volunteer, you know, coordinating them. And when I was, after I worked at, uh, in Lansing at the, uh, with the private college and universities, when I had one other job before I moved back to Grand Rapids, and that was coordinating the state of Michigan for a ballot question. And that's a big, big uh, scheduling and lots of articulating what you need people to do program. So I did that. It was a lot of learning. It was great. You had to move to Detroit because that's where all the people are, you know. But did that for a year, and then I moved back to Grand Rapids, and that's when I met Jeff, and then when I was injured a year later. So I was at God's Kitchen, like I said, for 22 years. And about halfway through, I, um, my, sadly, my sister passed away. She had a heart attack. She was 52. I was 40 years old. I'm 12 years younger than she is. And I really, at that point in my life, I thought, well, I'm not immortal. I'm going to die someday. I better do something. So I went back to school and got a master's in social work. And I'm glad to say that I had two really, really interesting and wonderful um, internships. And my supervisor, Jack Finn, from my second internship is right back here today. You yeah, haven't seen him in years. Learned so much from him. The only thing, it was the juvenile court for Kent County. The only glitch that was there was one of the first things that he said to me was, how's Gary, who is my brother-in-law, Jeff's brother? And I'm going, how do you know my brother-in-law? He goes, well, I was his probation officer. I go, oh, great. <laughs> Just love hearing that. I said, I knew, he was in, I knew he was involved with the courts, but I didn't know it was at the juvenile level. But it was interesting, but I remember Jack, too, telling, talking to me about the fact that my uncle, my dad's older brother, was one of the very first probation officers in Grand Rapids. He and another guy were, I don't know, had sociology degrees or something. And they became probation officers. And Jack knew the family. But yeah, I learned so much. So there's where I got my confidence back. I thought, you know, I'm going to go to school. I'll learn some new skills. And now, and that's exactly what happened. Now I had new skills. Now I could speak about this and this and this that I didn't know before. So that really, really helped in my rehab. It helped with my self-esteem. It helped me understand I knew what to do. And I've thought that many times where I'm trying to figure out, should I do this, or I feel funny about this, or these issues are here. And you know what I do? I think, I know what to do. And then you just do it. So back to uh, God's Kitchen. Like I said, I was there all those years. We had so many wonderful programs. One of them was called Special Delivery. We, uh, we had done a study through Grand Valley that pointed out that about a third of the people on the Meals on Wheels rosters were using or had the food that came at noon and that's all the food that they had, that they didn't have access to other food, and they weren't resourceful. So we, uh, I was packing groceries. We, we started delivering groceries, and I was packing groceries or supervising packing groceries with a woman, and she said to me, after I'm done here, I'm going over to straight school. Because the principal over there caught a little girl. Her name was Melanie. She was five years old. And she was looking through the trash. And Marianne Prezichenko was the principal. And she said, what are you doing? 
He said, I'm looking for food to take home to my family. So Mary Ann's like, whoa. So she said she went into her office and cried for a while. And then she started looking around for some source of food that wasn't an after-school program like a cookie and some milk. She was talking about a, a meal that the kids could take home in the evening. So she started looking around for groups and this woman, Patty, that was packing, said, I'm taking some juice boxes and some granola bars over there. And I said, really? I said, well, maybe I better talk to Mary Ann. So I called Mary Ann up and went over there. And she was explaining to me that in the interim, while she was finding out about Melanie and what other kids in her family or the school might also be in the same situation where they couldn't stretch their family dollar to feed their kids supper. Uh, she had discovered that at Strait and Sibley and you know, Harrison Park School, that between the three of them, that the principals could identify 125 kids. So we started feeding 125 kids. This was in the fall of 2001. So it was, it was not an easy discussion. We went back to God's Kitchen and I said, I found out about these 125 kids. And like I said, it was the fall of 2001. It was right after the bombings in New York. And they told me, they said, no way. People are cutting programs. There's no money. We're not doing it. Well, I went home that night and tried to sleep. Couldn't sleep. Thinking about Melanie and her little yellow dress digging through the trash. So I went back to God's Kitchen the next day. Called up my boss and said, I can't sleep. You said money is the, the money is the problem. And I'm saying to you, if I raise the money, can I do it? Well, she said, I'll have to let you know, call me back. They said that they would let me do it, which I said, thank you. When I raised the money, my sister-in-law's father was a philanthropist in town. He gave me $1,000, someone else gave me $1,000. And then Armin gave me another thousand dollars. And we started feeding 125 kids a sack supper. I opted for that meal because kids go to after school, they go to their grandma's, they go home. It's a portable meal, it's not anything hot that they have to deal with. So we, like I said, we started feeding 125 kids. Never in my mind, ever, 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 would I think that 20 years later we would be feeding 10,000 kids? Never thought the problem was that big. And of course, you know, the economy's been like a roller coaster up and down and up and down. So, but we've been very calculated in our growth. And I'm very, very proud of Kids Food Basket. You know, people say, we well, you know it's wonderful that you've done all this. Yeah, me and 40,000 volunteers. I mean, you know, we just have the most faithful and wonderful supporters and benefactors and volunteers, like a couple hundred volunteers a day. So we were in Grand Rapids, started out at St. Mary's Church in the basement. After we left God's Kitchen, oh, I forgot to say I changed jobs. I went to Disability Advocates of Kent County. And I knew that I would not be able to, on a daily basis, coordinate the volunteers, get food, do everything that we needed to feed the kids. So I ran into George Hartwell. He was at the Community Leadership Program at Grand Valley, excuse me, at Aquinas. And it was, he, I ran into him at some social function. And I said, hey, George, I could use an intern just to run the day-to-day -day stuff for Kids Food Basket. That was before I was even named. 
And he said, well, I've got, a, I've got somebody that I think would work out. Her name is Bridget, and she's our executive director today. Bridget Clark Whitney, and she's a powerhouse. Here's a woman that is like a cheerleader. She's not like a cheerleader, she is a cheerleader. And I watch her speak, and people are looking around and saying, where do I sign up? She is just like one of those people that's just so passionate about what she's doing. So wonderful and smart and articulate and just everything that you need to be. And she's been our executive director since we named the program Kids Food Basket. We've been very calculated in our growth. We started out, like I said, Grand Rapids Public Schools. And then in the middle of oh, 2009, is right, at, right around 2008 or nine, I think it was, there was an article in the Grand Rapids Press talking about all the pockets of poverty. And so we extended our program to Godwin and out to Cutlerville. And then several years later, we moved to Muskegon. So we're in Muskegon, and then we moved to Holland and to the south part of Holland, and we're in El Elgin County also. But, you know, we have a huge staff, lots and lots of volunteers, lots of people helping us out. Like I said, feeding 10,000 kids. That's the good news, although we'd like to be out of business, you know, not feeding other people's kids. But... We're not done with our work yet. We have lots of schools on our waiting list. It did a really great job over the pandemic uh, serving families and stuff too because there was so much need and people, you know, calling us up and saying, I'm, you know, I'm here with my kids. I have four kids. Don't have any way to get food. And just, you know, it's really sad. So we started doing family boxes too. But you know, you gotta rise to the occasion to do what you can. But yeah, I'm very, very proud of Kids Food Basket. We have 35 different groups of, of clubs and stuff from Grand Valley alone. We have the same number, 35 different groups of people with varying disabilities that come regularly and just, it's amazing. Then we have the farm. We are on nine and a half acres right at Leonard and Plymouth in Grand Rapids. And we farm probably eight of the acres right now and growing stuff all year long. In fact, they're planting now tomatoes. And then any of the excess we uh, deliver to pantries in Grand Rapids. Yep, and the kids come. They love it. They love it. One little girl said she didn't understand why her, uh, didn't understand where carrots came from. They, they say that if children plant the seed and actually harvest it, that they're much more likely to dry it. Yeah, it's great. And we have curriculum that go along with it. So in the schools, they talk about nutrition. And that leads me to the fact that March is Go Orange, which is talks about childhood hunger. But it's also National Nutrition Month. So in combination, the two of them, we raise a lot of awareness. We have 65 different groups who are doing stuff. And they'll either deliver brown paper bags that people have Colored, has anybody ever colored any brown paper bags? Yeah, the kids love them. Got to tell you a story about a little boy. The, his teacher did a home uh, visit, and he said, do you want to see my room? She said, sure, and so she goes, the teacher goes into the room, and he's got the brown paper, paper bags that people have colored taped up on his wall. And she said, why do you have those up there? 
And he said, because they're mine. That's a tearjerker. Yeah, so these kids, they just love and they fight over those bags. Yeah, it's great. It's such a wonderful way to help. And then we have different groups that are doing food drives for us or kids who have pickle sales at the school and give us the money or the FBI hats on for hunger. So there's lots of wonderful ways that people can help out. The, the things that I am most proud of at Kids Food Basket are that a third of our, our volunteers are under 18 years old, that 78% of the people that we feed have had a chance to volunteer. That's unheard of. And then last but not least, that we are feed the kids a fruit and a vegetable every day. So, and I want to invite all of you to come and volunteer. So you let me know when it's a good time. We always need volunteers. We always need groups. It's, uh, you know, even though we're doing something that, if you really think about it, it's sad, you know, that a little kid doesn't have food. It's very powerful when you have that sandwich or that bag in your hand. And you know if you weren't doing that right now, that a little kid wouldn't eat. I mean, that's pretty basic in my mind. So come volunteer with us. The other thing is I want to talk about, just real quick, about maintaining balance in our lives. When I was working at God's Kitchen, my old boss, Carol Greenberg, says, Mary Kay, you gotta, you got to work less. you got to work less. You're working too much. She said to me, she said, I think because you cannot control a lot of things in your life. She said that is something you can control, but you gotta watch it, you gotta get that balance back. And I really took that to heart because I think I was working too hard. But so you gotta make sure that you keep that balance in your life. I'm not gonna back up over are you, am I? I'm not running you over back there, am I? That's, that's a good thing. All right, and the only other thing that I wanted to talk about really was, you know, very humbly, I received these awards. I mean, this was really the granddaddy of awards, of course. Um, there were only 6,000 people nominated for this. So they called me up from the White House, and it, I've got caller ID, it says the White House. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay. So the guy says to me, tell me, you know, that they've narrowed it down to 40 people. And now the president is going to narrow it down for the people that receive the Presidential Citizens Medal. So he called me back about a week later, said, yeah, I think you're, you know, it's looking good. And I said, he said to me, have you ever done anything in your past? that might embarrass the president. And I said, probably take me off the list. I was not kidding. I thought, oh man, I probably did something when I was at Michigan State that I can't even remember. And you know, I mean, cause I was pretty much a party girl. But anyway, and you'll see if you get to buy my book and read about my life that I was, until I got into grad school, I was pretty much looking for a party. Uh, but anyway, the, the guy said, no, 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 I'm, I'm leaving you on the list. I'm rooting for you. And I made the A-list, and boy, was that a, a memorable day. Just to go to the White House. First of all, to be invited to the White House. And Emma's going to read. I always go places. People always want to know about the Presidential Citizen Medal, even though it happened in 2010. I never had the medals, but I have them today. I remembered the medals. She's going to read the proclamation for us. Physical limitations have never hindered Mary Kay Hoodhood's determination to serve her community. Though a car accident left her paralyzed, she began volunteering to feed the hungry through her local Meals on Wheels program. In 2001, she founded Kids Food Basket, which provides meals to thousands of children in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area. Area. The United States honors Mary Kay Hoodhood for her remarkable efforts to nourish our nation's children.
<laughs> that, that was pretty amazing. All right. So, how am I doing on time here? Because I will entertain questions. I want you to know that within the last month, I went to speak to three classes of fifth graders over at Zinzer School. Nobody could ask me a harder question than this little girl. She said to me, well, first one, somebody said, will you tell us how you were injured? So I told them all that. She said to me, have you ever felt insecure in your disability? And I said, I'm not even sure if I know what that means. Maybe. But I think I did explain it to her. And I was telling her that when I was initially injured, little kids would always stare at me, which they still do too. People are always looking at me. I, I love the looks. Either you're looking at me and thinking, I don't want to be you, or they're looking at me and thinking, I'm really, really sorry for you. Or they're looking at me and saying, if I'm a little kid, I want that wheelchair. <laughs> That's what they're thinking. And at first when I'd see these little kids and they're staring at me, I'm thinking, what is your mother? And then when I started talking to them, what it is, they want to know about this wheelchair and they want me out and them in. <laughs> and they, they're so cute and then I, have to explain to them the difference between have to ride in a wheelchair and get to ride in a wheelchair. I said, if you have to ride in it every day, it's not as great a contraption as you think. But So, anybody have any questions? You couldn't ask a harder question than that little girl for sure. Hi, when, when no fault reform came into play, did you lose any benefits? So, you know, I work for a lobbyist. Boy, did I want to go down there and lobby. Tell them, what are you, don't do that. Yes, but, uh, and you know, I really, really feel sorry for people that don't have the resources or they're just not in tune with it. I was smart enough to call my legislator, and she put me in touch with the insurance regulatory office. So the guy, I called the guy up, and he read the the whole chain, all the changes to me. Well, I know how to read in between the lines, and I listened to what he said. Yeah, sure, it was going to affect me that they were telling me that my primary caregiver, my husband, can't be compensated for, less, it was, I think it was 56 hours. Yeah, yeah, they were gonna try to take that. Unless you negotiate a, a contract with, with your adjuster. Well, I know how to do that. So I negotiated the, the the contract with my adjuster, which took probably six weeks to get it all because, you know, she's throwing stuff in there that I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? That's not happening. You know, I know how to lobby for myself, but you know, and my husband is a great advocate for me. Like when I'm really sick and out of it, you know, he's watching what's going on. So the day, the day that she was calling me to tell me that she was sending me the contract, and then I'd sign it and send it back to her to sign. She calls me up and she said, my office is closing, we're liquidating. I'm not gonna be your adjuster anymore. I think, what the hell are you talking about? So I said, well, okay, how do I get a new adjuster? I gotta have someone who's you know, paying my, taking care of my attendance and stuff. And so we had made a mistake in sending the hours in. So like two days later, I called her back. I go, hey, we made a math mistake here. Sorry, our fault. 
And I said, to, I, you know, I owe somebody, one of my attendants, 150 bucks. And I, I said, sorry, but we, you know, it was innocent. So she called me back a day later and she goes, oh, my boss said I can keep you. Well, you're not liquidating what's going on, who knows. So then I had to call some guy over in Pennsylvania and have him authorize. It's just a mess. They don't know what they're doing. But yeah, it did try to affect me, but I made sure that it didn't affect me. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mary. I'm Brady. I'm a senior here at Grand Valley. Um, thanks for talking with us today. I would love it if you could speak to a little bit the challenge of knowing how and when to ask for and to accept help. Um, and I ask because I, I have the honor of living with my grandfather right now, and he as he his physical health declines, I can watch him get really discouraged. And he's constantly saying how much of a bother he is to other people and how he doesn't want to ask for help and all these things. And I look at that and I think, oh, that's just something an older person has that, to do. No, and then, no. And then I, I look at myself and I say, can I ask for help? And I really have trouble with that. And no, I, I know a I lot know. of people in this room are so used to being oh. self-driven and not asking for that. So I'm curious if you could speak yeah. to that, that journey of learning how and when oh, to do that. Oh, it was awful. It is awful. It, it drives me out of my mind. But what are you going to do about it, you know? Um... I think you just really, really got to get over it. Just really have to say, look, this is, I, I'm going to contribute in another way. But I can't get my drink of water. I can't brush my teeth. So I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and have somebody else help me. But, you know, the key is if you got people that are doing it in a loving way. But it gets old. It gets old on my end where I'm asking for something every other second, and I'm sure it gets old on their, well, not my, not my attendants. They're great, they're young. They've got energy, which, you know, mine has gone a long time ago. But, you know, I'm sure for my husband, how many, you know, how many times is he gonna push my hair out of my eye? How many times is he gonna blow my nose for me? You know, how many times is he gonna lift me every day of my life? So I'm sure for Jeff, and he can answer that himself if you'd want him to, because, yeah, no yeah. Way. yeah, no kidding, I can't, I can't afford you. I know I can't afford you, I'm sorry, but I, I'm gonna call her back. I know, I know, because, yeah, it, it, it is, it does get old very fast. And you do feel, you know, like when you were independent, and mine was from one day to the next, you know. I mean, I'm 27 years old, and I'm running around doing what I want to do, and I close my eyes and I open them up two days later, and I'm in a bed that was a rotated back and forth. It was called a rotorest bed. They don't have those beds anymore because they found out that they cause, cause brain damage. Well, thanks a hell of a lot for that, <laughs> you know? So I'm in this bed, and it was, it was sort of funny, though. I, I found amusement in the fact that people had to walk back and forth to talk to me. So it would go to the left, go to the left, and then go to the right. And, and, but, you know, it was awful. And I had all that time to think, and I had a tracheotomy, so I'm not talking either. You know, and yeah, it was, and then when, when I wrote this, when we wrote this book, I have a ghostwriter. I don't pretend to be a writer. She is so good. Oh, she's a wordsmith. She was so good and took my life and times and made them interesting. And it was very, very difficult to revisit all that. Mary and Prezchenko, the same woman who caught the little girl digging through the trash, we got together to do a documentary about starting Kids Food Basket. So here she is. She goes, you need to write a book. I said, I don't think so. And she said, no, Mary Kay, you really need to tell your story. And I said, Mary Ann, it sounds like a lot of work to me, and I am not up for it. Well, she worked and worked on me until finally it's like, and here was the tipping point. So during the pandemic, 
she had, she had three people that she knew that committed suicide within a month. And she said, there's so much hopelessness out there that yours is a story of hope. And I'm thinking, you know, there are a lot of hopeless, sad people, and things are a mess. And if one person can read my book and say, if she did that, then I can do something, mm -hmm. then I've done my job. Because we're all in this together, you know. We're all in this together. There's not an us and a them. It's all of us. And that's why I'm delighted that I live here in Grand Rapids. Because we are givers. People around here, they give their time, they give their talent, they give their expertise, they show up, they help out, they know that childhood hunger in our community is a problem, it's a community problem, and they know it's their job to help out to feed these kids. And we're doing it, and the kids appreciate it. So thank you for them. We have a question from one of our students on Zoom for you. Um, Mary Claire asked, you shared a lesson you learned early in life, that peace comes from within. It sounds like when your peace was disturbed by witnessing a child dig through the, car the garbage to find food, you were relentless in identifying and participating in a solution. Outside of perseverance, do you have any other recommendations to find peace within? Yeah, meditation and prayer. You know, I've really learned to meditate over the years. Pray a lot. And just know that there is joy and happiness in some of the small things in life. You know, appreciate a flower. Appreciate a good laugh with a friend. Appreciate when your grandson tells you that he is J.R. the the jump rapper, and he's going to do a video for us. I never laughed so hard. I was crying. I was laughing. I called him the gum rapper, and then I'm the announcer, and then he yells at me about the way that I announce. He doesn't like how I'm announcing it, and he's dabbing me make noises that I can't make, and just, you know, to find find joy in the small things, and nurture your relationships. You know, when I was laying there all the time in that rotorest bed rocking back and forth, I thought, I will not let my disability define me. I will not let my disability deter me from doing everything that I can. And I will not be a complainer. I just, I've been around people that complain all the time and it just drives you crazy, you know? And I know that people have a lot of legitimate beefs in life, but I just am really trying not to complain. Do I complain much, Em? No. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, and you know, it's not easy. I'm not saying that any of the stuff, especially, all the times after rehab, or the times when I've been very, very sick. I had two or three other times in the last 43 years where I was hanging on by a thread. One time I was so sick and I was in the hospital and I, had, I was on a ventilator again. I've been on a ventilator three times. And I was on a ventilator again and couldn't talk. Woke up, felt like crap. Was in, they had one of those boards like you can check out a, or letters, you know, because they couldn't read my lips. And so uh, Brian was one of my attendants. He was with me for 12 years. And he just stopped working for me a couple of years ago. He took the note, and the note was for me to tell Jeff. If it was time to let me go, he needed to let me go. And so Brian looks at that and he goes, 
I'll write it out, but I'm not reading it to him. He can read it to himself. And Jeff reads it and he goes, what the hell are you talking about? You're getting better. And I said, well, nobody told me, or I mouth, nobody told me, because I didn't feel, you know, but then two days later, I'm feeling better and back at it. But yeah, it's, it has not been easy. But I'm with the man that loves me. He's made my life much more ordinary than it could have been, you know, just every day. And I'm very lucky that I have people that love me and, and support me. And that's what it is. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for all your hard work. Um, I work in a school as a student teacher right now, and my kids actually get food bags every Friday, and the relief in their eyes is extraordinary. Um, Where do you work? I work actually through Kennewell, but at Alpine Elementary, so we have a lot more impoverished students. Um, so I just want to say thank you on that note first, because I appreciate that relief of seeing my kids in a relief state. Yes, uh -huh. right. Um, but also, I just want to ask about, you know, I also am a mother of two young children as well. So I'm really big on advocacy and how do we get students to speak for themselves, but then to speak for others. So how can I work on that with not only my, my young children, but also with my students? How can we get them to advocate for themselves, but then take that step farther and advocate for others as well? Yeah, I know. That's, that's, that's hard to do. It is, I think you, it's by example, that if you, you know, if your kids see you, you know, championing other people, that they will, they'll understand how important that is. Um, when my grandson, JJ, and, and he can be a handful, I called he and my husband loud and louder, and the JJ's the louder, and he is, He's determined, and he's got a mind of his own, and he says, my mommy never lets me do it. I'm like, oh, my God, kid, get a grip. But anyway, so he can be a handful. And even in kindergarten, he was having a few little rough patches. Well, now in first grade, we, I was so delighted when his mom told me that in the uh, conference. They said that he was funny, smart, and a good friend. Well, the most important part is the good friend. So yeah, I think just by example, that they see you championing other people's causes and see you volunteer that they'll pick up on that because they love to help. You know that better than I do because you're around all those kids. Especially, yeah, that's hard. Like I said, I did my student teaching, I thought, Whoa, I'd be really bad at this. I better not do it. So that was smart. I didn't. Do we have another question? We have time for one more. Hi there. First off, I wanted to thank you for Kids Food Basket. Um, I work at Stocking Elementary, and they get the sack lunches. And when you shared your story about um, the kid who would put the um, bags on the wall, we yeah. have a kid that every week he likes to take his envelopes and or his bags, and he'll make like elephant ears and stuff. But besides that, I had a question for you. Um, you mentioned earlier that there are hundreds of schools that are on the wait list, um, and we're all the, the leaders of the future. What can we do to help with that? Because we talk about like volunteering and um, coloring the sack lunches, but how does it work with like developing new schools and organizations? Well, yeah, it, it costs a pretty penny every, you know, to take for kids food basket to take on a new school. We, it, we really have to uh, figure about $20,000 a year to cover the school, you know, depending on the size. And so, you know, we're, very calculated in our growth. I mean, we, you know, we can say there's this many kids, but if we want to be able to say, yeah, we can feed you this year, but we can feed you next year too. And so, you know, it's just all the little things that we're doing in Go to Orange Month. And it's, you know, getting kids to do it, it hats on for hunger days, you know, to do food drives, to do all the stuff that it takes 
to be able to put that sack supper together. You know, it's not easy. But yeah, that's the way that we do it. And we'll, we'll get to our end, but we're, so, and then, you know, of course, we're doing all the, the stuff to make sure that the, the kids understand about good nutrition. You know, years ago, we had a, a donor say, you know, if you fed the kids lesser quality food, then you could feed more kids. I said, nope, we're not going there. You know, that fruit and that vegetable is so important in the grain and, and the protein. So we're not, we're not skimping on the nutrition here just because it'd be, uh, we could feed more kids. Well, yeah, you could feed more kids a bunch of crap or you can maintain what you know is important and make sure that you, the quality of the food is there. So thank you all for your time and attention. You know, it's always glad to come out in the community and thank people like you guys who have helped us do whatever you've done. Just, you know, just love being out here. So thank you. And thank you, Mary, for, for spending this afternoon sharing your story with us. Sure. You know, it's funny that you talk about how you would have been a really crappy teacher, but I know there's a strong correlation between a full stomach yeah. and a strong education. So oh, um, yeah. it's amazing that you found a way to be impactful in classrooms That's right, across I know. West Michigan, even with the work that you're doing here. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you to all of us, all of you who have joined us both in person and virtually. We're so glad you could make it. Um, today and I would now like you uh, to join us in the exhibition hall to continue our conversations. Yeah. Uh, we have refreshments and you'll also notice at each of the tables we have some of those brown paper bags as well as some markers, crayons, drawing implements. So as you're eating and chatting, please feel free to decorate a few bags. Those bags will be delivered to Kids Food Basket and will be a part of a child sack supper. And we also will be offering copies of Mary's memoir for sale. Uh, and I, I heard that she might be around to, to chat with folks afterwards, um, so I would really encourage you to pick up a copy of that book. It truly, as, as you've heard from tonight, a really incredible story. And also a quick invitation, you are all welcome to join us next Tuesday to celebrate President's Day at 6 p.m. right here in Lucemore Auditorium as well. Um, again, thank you so much and travel safe.